Canada was one of the first countries uh, in the world to uh, legalize uh, the market of cannabis. Uh, can you explain how the regulation looks like in Canada and uh, uh, what are the lessons learned? Sure. So we have a we have a phased approach of legalization. So the law was passed in the fall of 2017, uh, but not implemented yet until 2018. And we started out slow. So we allowed things like uh, cannabis flowers and seeds and oils and allowed people to grow plants. But things like edibles uh, were, or vape pens, for example, weren't allowed. Um, and so uh, one year after that, 2019, uh, then the regulations were adjusted to allow those in. So it's a bit of a phased in approach to see how things happen. And um, it's largely a model where the federal government is controlling licenses for suppliers and the provincial governments and the territorial governments. So we have 13 provinces and territories and all, and uh, they, they each have a bit of their own system of how they distribute on the ground and so uh, some of them have allotted for uh, public uh, run dispensaries. Uh, I think almost every province or territory has online sales. Uh, some of them have uh, private dispensaries available as well and so they're, they're deciding a little bit about how, how it's distributed, uh, who has access to the licenses to distribute, what types of form it takes and that. So um, yeah, so that's, that's basically the, the system. Um, and right now we're, we're still in a bit of a learning phase where we're trying to get data to see what uh, the impact is. People are naturally curious about whether uh, legalizing cannabis would change rates of use, uh, particularly among youth or whether it would affect things like drug driving and uh, thing, things like that. And, and also, also largely one of the uh, measures we're looking at is whether it's had an impact on the unregulated market for cannabis, which was quite large before legal regulation. Is the black market uh, diminishing now? Uh, yes, yeah, so we don't. We don't like to say the black market, um, but rather the unregulated market. Um, so it, it, there is a sign that it's diminishing. And so today, uh, today in the plenary here at the CND, um, Michel Boudreau, the head of the Canadian delegation, mentioned that 30% of the unregulated market had been uh, diminished uh, because of the legal regulation. And so they tracked tracked that. I think it's it's difficult to measure because uh, the fact is it was an unregulated market. Market, uh, they're never really, you know, they don't they don't report uh, to the government or don't fill out tax forms or things. So it's largely an estimate of who's operating in that space, and so uh, it's um, you know it's still a guess of how how it's been reduced. But I think they they measure it by known uh, activity of known actors and things like that, and how it's reduced. Why was this unregulated market so resistant? Why why? Could it survive so much? Well, I think it's, it's just pervasive. And so I think, uh, you know, Canada had has some of the largest cannabis consumption rates in the world, particularly among uh, young people, uh, where uh, at, at one point a few years ago, it was 47% uh, of all young people had uh, used cannabis at some point in their life. And so that was, uh, at one point, that was the highest rate in the world. And so I think there's largely uh, an environment where a lot of people were producing um, cannabis and also consuming it and so also a lot of the production of cannabis was being exported to the US uh, prior to states like Washington or Oregon legalizing there were big markets there uh, looking for for cannabis as well and so I think I think what um, at one point I think there was an estimate that the the unregulated cannabis market was work, worth about six to eight billion dollars US uh, or, or Canadian um, and uh, and so so just like it was just a really long term and entrenched uh, market that wasn't really uh, you know the police really didn't have a lot of effect in disrupting it or getting rid of it so what were the major shortcomings of the 
of the of the low first, like in the first year, and how could you overcome those uh, shortcomings? Right. So I think I think some of the things we've learned are uh, largely around uh, how how the market should be structured, and uh, also around principles that we want to uh, ensure in place around legal regulation. So things like uh, it's really important, uh, you know, for um, a, a, for a long time the use of cannabis or possession of cannabis or selling of cannabis is criminalized. And so when, when we take the action to legalize the market, we want to make sure that people who have criminal records or are currently you know, suffering from criminalization of cannabis are, um, are repaired. And so uh, th there, there was a lot of uh, talk initially about efforts to expunge records or to clear criminal cases, criminal records, uh, but that hasn't been done yet. And so there's now a, a bill that uh, before the federal government around uh, pardons, uh, what we call record suspensions, uh, which is not quite the same effect and it won't be as proactive. Uh, and, and a lot of times people are uh, continue to be stigmatized for activities that are legal today. And so uh, that was something that definitely we've, we should have had in place and thought about beforehand. Uh, there was also uh, right now, uh, the, the I would say there's largely been a domination in the cannabis market with large companies that are able to be efficient suppliers and, and have the capital to invest in it. And uh, a lot of these people who had been growing illegally and some who continue to grow uh, are not necessarily all related to organized crime. Sometimes they're just like, you know, small small micro growers, like they might be growing like a micro beer or something uh, brewing. And, and those people have not had a lot of easy opportunities to enter into the market and produce legally. And so uh, that's changing a little bit uh, slowly, but it's uh, something that wasn't really planned out well in advance uh, before that. And then um, I think also just largely around there's some issues around generally access to cannabis now and it's not necessarily equal. Uh, some places have don't have dispensaries where people can go, uh, although as I said, most places have most provinces have online distribution, but not everybody wants to shop for cannabis with you know they want to see it or feel it or uh, experience it. And so I think those are some of the things we're we're trying to figure out and largely, Largely, our model was created from a very public health focused approach. And so uh, restrictions were, were very tight. Prices were set high to discourage use. Um, packaging is, is very uh, secure and child proof and you know, uses a lot of plastic and is not environmentally friendly. And uh, it seems to me, in my opinion, you know, there really wasn't a lot of input or uh, desire to meet the needs of what consumers would use and so I think we have we have a number where around you know 30 percent of people are, are using the legal market after two years that number could certainly be higher uh, because a lot of people are, are resisting using the legal market because it's too expensive or it's not the product they're looking for or it has too much packaging or it's not convenient and so uh, I, I think in hindsight, it would have been really valuable to work with consumers of cannabis to create models that they really enjoyed and really wanted to uh, be a part of. Can you explain us what is uh, Cannabis 2.0? Right. So, you know, there, there's a movement now largely from people who, uh, so, some people who are activists around cannabis legalization and who uh, are large, you know, heavy can cannabis consumers who don't like the current regulated system. And so when, when the government created a new regulated system, they also created a whole lot of criminal offenses for people who operated outside the system. So, for example, if you're purchase if you're holding too much cannabis, Cannabis, over 30 grams on your person, or if you're uh, distributing cannabis to a youth, even if you're somebody who's who's 20, uh, giving a joint to an 18-year-old friend and share, social sharing, uh, that's still a criminal activity, and you could be charged criminally for that. And so, um, th th things like that. And then, you know, if you've grown more than four plants, for example, you're creating a you're um, you're, you're uh, participating in a criminal offense. And so uh, I think those people have sort of termed, termed this as like 
Prohibition 2.0 or Cannabis 2.0. And so I think I think a lot of that is just reflective of uh, the, the fact that the market is was created a bit too tightly. And the, the logic the logic that I'm told is that, well, it's easier, it's always easier to loosen up the restrictions rather than tighten them up afterwards. So we're, we're definitely encouraging the government to loosen up the restrictions a bit, to uh, look a bit more at, at pricing, which is now affected a lot by taxation. Uh, to try to make it more competitive with the unregulated market uh, and just make it a bit more user-friendly and accessible. Can we say that the Canadian market is over-regulated? Um, it, it's hard to say. Like, I, I don't know. I think, I think from an a activist point of view, like, we're, it's amazing. Like, we, we actually are, you know, we're the second uh, nation in the world to legally regulate cannabis. And, and in this environment, like at the UN, where that's, that's very um, taboo and it's not talked about and it's not treated very, very well. Uh, so I, I'll, give, I'll give the government credit for taking the step in, into regulation. And I think, I think it's, it's just as it's too early to see the outcome of the system of regulation, it's probably too early to say, for example, it's over-regulated. Like I think, I think we, we have common objectives of uh, public health, ensuring public health, ensuring uh, sort of safety is in place, that people are educated and are doing it properly. Like my own opinion is we, we are probably in a point now where we know enough about the system to allow it to loosen up a little bit. So I'd say, I'd say like, yeah, to a degree, there's too much regulation. Uh, it's, it's cannabis. It's not like it's... Um, you know, it's not like it's it's a, a nuclear weapons, for example, or handguns. You know, the, it's it's a it's a substance we know nobody dies from. Uh, we know that it's consumed regularly uh, around there. At the, and at the same time, we want to create programs that maybe uh, allow young people uh, to, you know, discourage young people from using, but also understand that they, if they are using, what kinds of harm reduction measures can we put in place for them? We see many Canadian companies going to other countries now and uh, uh, try to lobby there, like in Mexico, South Africa. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, I, I think it's a problem, and, and it's it's something that uh, definitely we're concerned about. And um, I, I think it's you know it's sort of uh, reminiscent of uh, colonization and and some of the uh, the the habits of of different companies around the world that would exploit uh, for things like sugar sugar cane or for mining companies. And so I think I think largely what we'd like to see is uh, Canadian companies uh, model. Uh, social equity, and uh, in in many of these places in Mexico, in Jamaica, in Colombia, people have produced crops for a long time. Uh, they they've produced them in the face of uh, very serious consequences of prohibition. And if a system is loosened up now to allow things like medical cannabis or uh, non uh, non medical use of cannabis, uh, we really need to create spaces that allow uh, traditional growers and uh, particularly people who are marginalized to have a space in those markets. And I think that's something that, um, you know, Canadian companies or uh, w with a large um, capital to invest and with a lot of political clout and even even access to things like technology and, and resources uh, can, can definitely have the ability to overpower. Uh, those small-time growers, but I think it's, it's really wrong, and, and I think we need to put our ethics uh, in place and really operate as a good, a good a global partner and neighbor. Um, and, and I don't want to say, I don't want to say that Canadian companies or, or companies from cannabis companies from anywhere in the world shouldn't have some. Uh, role, but it really should be driven by the local people, and we need to ensure that they have a space in the market and can make. You know, it's not just Canadians getting rich off of uh, off of these, but but these local people can can make a living as well.